and welcome to On The Ledge podcast episode 139. I'm your host Jane Perrone and I've got a confession. This week's show is not quite what it was going to be. I was planning to do Diva Week this week in which I was putting out short episodes over five days about different diva plants. But You know, life being life, it's taken a little longer than expected to pull that together. So no divas this week, apart from me, of course. Uh, So instead, what have you got? Well, this week's show is a bit of a ragtag and bobtail affair. I have dug out a mini episode that I did a while back, but never put out about Wolfie. I'm just turning to look at the dog. Yes, he's very excited. He's spark out on the sofa. And there's also a soundscape from my shed. And I answer a question about a dendromium orchid. And there's more. Yes, there's even more. We hear from listener Gabby. A few thank yous to kick off with. Jay, Hannah and Jonathan have both donated via co-fi.com. Claire gave a donation via PayPal. And Olivia, Alison and Eva have all become Patreon subscribers. Thank you to all of you for supporting On The Ledge. And you can find out how to donate in various ways to the show via the show notes or leave me a review. I recently realised you can't leave reviews on Spotify. So... If you listen to the podcast on Spotify, that's absolutely fine. I use Spotify myself. It's it's grand, but you can't leave a review, which is a shame. So maybe, I don't know, shout over the garden fence to your neighbour about on the ledge or phone a friend and uh, tell them about the show. I don't know. I'm sure you can find some way of supporting the show without having to go through the admittedly torturous process of leaving a review on Apple Podcasts. And advance warning that it is garden day on Sunday. Now, I am not a great proponent of days, as it were. World Naked Gardening Day. I put a comment on Instagram saying the closest I'm going to get to World Naked Gardening Day is not wearing a brooch on Instagram because, (laughs) quite frankly, I I don't really get World Naked Gardening Day. No shade if, if you're into it. It's just... It just doesn't really do it for me. Anyway, but Garden Day is something I can get behind. So this is a day, this coming Sunday, May the 10th, 2020, which is just celebrating the wonderful effect of gardens. And that can be indoor or outdoor, I should emphasise, on our good selves. And you can watch various videos by gardening luminaries of various kinds and so on. The main website is gardenday.co.uk. So do go and check that out. There's also lots going on on social media. And if you look up the hashtag gardendayuk, you will find all of that. So what better than celebrating our gardens this bank holiday weekend? Anyone who has been listening to On The Ledge for any stretch of time will be aware of my podcast mascot, Wolfie Perone. This is my dog and he is much loved by the family and also by lots of other people who love to give him cuddles when we're walking down the street. Although right now, cuddles are banned, apart from one chap who just pounced on him and gave him a cuddle the other day Uh, but yeah at the moment during lockdown we're trying to resist strangers temptations to come and give him a cuddle but he is a very adorable dog and he is a wonderful companion and very good for a podcast because actually he's very quiet despite me complaining about his collar jingling sometimes actually he's a very quiet dog and in fact he's lying on the sofa his eyes half closed in his normal position, to be quite honest. He's a bit of a couch potato. So I've had lots of requests for more information about Wolfie. So this next segment is a chat I did. It must be a while ago, actually, because in this I say that Wolfie's eight. He's actually nine now. But nevertheless, it's all other other than his age is still true. And in this I discuss how we got him, what he is. He's a dog, obviously, but he's a specific kind of dog, etc., etc. If you are not interested in finding out about Wolfie, then if you fast forward about eight minutes, then you will get to the next bit of talk about plants. So you can bypass the dog chat quite easily in that way. So without any further ado, let's talk about Wolfie, aka Wolfbag, 
Le Loop Sportif, Snap, Barkus Wooferinicum, the Wolfmeister General, and <laughs> he has many nicknames. But anyway, let's get going and talk about Wolfie. If you're sticking around, I guess you want to hear all about Wolfie. Well, he is an eight-year-old dog. He's a lurcher. If you've never come across lurchers before, let me explain. They're a cross between a long dog, such as a greyhound or a whippet or a saluki, and either a terrier or a collie. And that means you can get lots and lots of different combinations. So you might get big lurchers, which might be a cross between a greyhound and a collie, say. And you get teeny tiny lurchers like Wolfie's kind of lurcher, which is a cross between a Bedlington Terrier and a Whippet. Now, Wolfie is predominantly, we think, this is only guesswork because we didn't have him as a puppy, but we think he's a cross between a Bedlington Terrier and Whippet. Probably more Whippet than Bedlington, and he's probably got some Greyhound in there thrown in for good luck, because he is that bit bigger than a lot of the Bedlington Whippets that you see out there. How do you know a Bedlington Whippet? Well, they're kind of shaggy, furry hounds with a whippety shape. Usually, or not always, but often they are a sort of a steel grey colour, what's known as blue in the dog world, uh, with white tips on their feet and on their chest. But this doesn't have to be that way. There are lots of other colour combinations you can get, but that is a common one. If you don't know what a Bedlington Terrier looks like, uh, imagine a lamb. When they're clipped for showing, they do look like lambs with a kind of bulgy, curly bit on top of their head. Bedlington Terriers, though, were trained as hunting dogs here, and they're tough little things. And the Whippets, on the other hand, are bred for speed, but both were dogs that were worked for catching rabbits and rats and things like that. And the Bedlington Whippet, and indeed the Lurcher more generally, is often associated with poachers because they were popular dogs for that line of work, uh, if you can call it work. So I don't do any hunting with Wolfie. He has never been trained to hunt, so he while he has a natural instinct to run after small moving things he doesn't really have any killer instinct whatsoever and now he's that bit older he's not really interested in uh, chasing them either so that's great sometimes these dogs are known as 100 mile an hour couch potatoes because they are either asleep on your sofa or running incredibly fast and yes Wolfie in his day could run incredibly fast. Unfortunately about 18 months ago now he slipped a disc which was a pretty serious injury. He tripped over a ball and while he was chasing after it and lost the use of his back legs for a little bit then ensued some very expensive treatment uh, at a specialist vet's, an MRI scan and lots of physio. And now he's pretty much 90% back to full health. What does Wolfie like doing? Laying in a soft, comfortable place. He is not a stoic kind of Labrador character. He will not sit on a hard floor unless he absolutely has to or unless it's very warm with sunshine falling on it. He wants a comfortable sofa. So he gets the run of the sofas in this house and sometimes we're squashed in the corner and Wolfie's stretched out. <laughs> Where did Wolfie come from? Well, he wasn't an abuse case, although he was a rehoming case. So he came from a lady in North who specialises in rehoming and rescuing lurchers and I was looking for him for quite a long time before I found him because I wanted uh, a shaggy lurcher as opposed to a smooth one. When I was growing up as a child we had Irish terriers which are those ginger terriers which have absolutely gorgeous beards and uh, wiry fur uh, and I wanted the look of that dog without the hard work of the coat and that really is what I got with Wolfie. So I, when I, we first found Wolfie four years ago, he was named Taz and we decided to rename him Wolfie. We had to go through a home check and then we went to pick him up one day and he has become a really firm part of our family. He's a wonderfully affectionate dog. He just loves a cuddle. He thinks everyone wants to cuddle him and everyone loves him. We managed to mostly train him up out of jumping up and licking people's faces, but he does love to lick a toddler's face if he gets the chance. He doesn't bother at all about my houseplants. He's completely uninterested in them. 
which is great. Um, the only time he'll be concerned if one falls over or I knock one over, that's the, the extent of his interest in houseplants. So he is the ideal companion for a podcast about houseplants. There is one other dog in my life I should mention. I volunteer for a charity in the UK called the Cinnamon Trust, and this is a charity that pairs up elderly people and the terminally ill with people who can walk and look after their dogs on a foster basis while they're in uh, the hospital having treatment. Uh, or in a hospice and I walk a little Westie that's a West Highland White Terrier called Bonnie I've started doing this for the last few weeks because her owner has broken her hip and Bonnie is a totally different character to Wolfie she's small she's lively she can run very fast probably not as fast as Wolfie and she just loves life and she's a real little firecracker and tremendous fun to walk so I've been enjoying walking her once a week and before that I used to walk a German shepherd a blonde German shepherd called Brie I'm not sure if she was named after the cheese Uh, A totally different kettle of fish. Big, gorgeous dog with loads of shaggy blonde hair. Amazing dog. A lot of hair, though. I wouldn't have fancied um, having to groom her because there was just enormous amounts of hair everywhere. But a wonderful dog and totally different from my Wolfie in that... She, German Shepherds are generally quite vocal dogs so when I used to go to pick her up take her for a walk she would be howling and barking and going nuts whereas Wolfie he literally almost never barks the only thing he would bark at is a cat on the conservatory roof or very occasionally he'll tell another dog off by barking at it but that's about it he is almost completely silent so that's actually quite a nice quality for a dog so those are the dogs in my life oh um, my parents there are actually more my parents have a doberman called heidi who is a rescue dog she came from a puppy farm where she was used for breeding and she is four years old Uh, i haven't met her yet because my parents don't live in the same country as me but uh, she's been fun they've had to teach her everything about living in a house because she has not been used to any of the home comforts so walking on a lead uh, house training all of that they've had to do but they're pretty experienced dog owners so they have done that and she is absolutely gorgeous apparently and very much in love with my dad so they're happy with their dog and my sister has a dog called Gilbert who is is he a cavapoo no is he a he's one of those poo dogs (laughs) I can't remember which type. Um, Cockapoo, I think, maybe. And he is a little steel grey bundle of energy uh, who she rehomed from an elderly lady. Uh, But he has got bags of life in him, even though he's 10 or 11. Uh, Again, I haven't met Gilbert yet, but I'm hoping to meet him uh, in the future. So those are the dogs in my life. And if you want to tell me about the dogs in your life, then please pop over to the Facebook group houseplant fans of on the ledge and in that group we have a thread going where you can share your dogs and i'll make sure that's at the top of the feed just so you can add your pets i know at least one of you has a dog called wolfie ohio tropics uh, has another wolfie um so if you've got a wolfie in your life or any other dog then i would love to hear about it on the facebook group if i haven't answered any of your questions about wolfie drop me a line and i'll be happy to do so and i'll stick a little post about wolfie on my website janeperone.com with some pictures enjoy that's enough canine chat it's time for meet the listener and this week we're meeting gabby from new york hi jane thanks so much for having me on to respond to the listener questions question one there's a fire and all your plants are about to burn which one do you grab as you escape If there was a fire, the plant that I'd probably grab first would be my pink princess philodendron. Uh, It was a bit of a splurge in these times of the corona pandemic, so that would be the first one to get out of the house safely. Question two. What is your favourite episode of On the Ledge? Um, My favourite episode would be the one on the coleus plant. Um, It's something I've been growing for the past two or three summers now on my porch. And what were once small little baby plants are now giant monsters that are growing in my plant pots. Question three. Which Latin name do you say to impress people? The Latin name that I say to impress people would be, hmm, probably Monstera Adansoni. Question four. Crassulation, acid metabolism or gotation? I'm a big fan of gotation. There's something kind of thrilling about seeing those little wet droplets on the end of leaves. 
Question 5. Would you rather spend £200 on a variegated monstera or £200 on 20 interesting cacti? In terms of what I would spend £200 on, I'd have to go with the variegated monstera. Thanks to Gabby for contributing to Meet the Listener. If you want to get involved, drop a line to on the ledge podcast at gmail.com and we'll drop over instructions. It's very straightforward. And now it's time for question of the week. And this one comes from Giskin, who has an issue with a dendrobium orchid. Giskin writes, I got it a couple of years ago and it's been a joy, flowering profusely for the first 18 months. It's also doubled in size. When it arrived, it had a quite a few stumps, which made me think it had been divided or cut back. With my other orchids, I know to prune flowering stems back to the next node after flowering, but I wondered whether my dendro needed something similar and should I be dividing those rooting branchlets at the base? I am no dendrobium expert, so I called on somebody who is to answer this question. Manos Canelos is the co-author of book Growing Orchids at Home, along with another orchid expert, Peter White. So he was just the person we needed to speak to. Thankfully, Manos was on hand to answer all Giskin's dendrobium queries and then some. I can see three questions here. The basically dendrobium, uh, what we're looking at, is a dendrobium nobili, which is native to Southeast Asia, and it is often referred as a cool-growing dendrobium, which is not doesn't do it justice in that it doesn't really need cool temperatures. Uh, but it's kind of special. It's a kind of a special orchid because it is one of the few commonly sold orchids that has a distinct growing and rest phase. Uh, its growing phase starts when you see buds on the new canes, and the rest phase starts uh, when the new canes have reached almost the height of the old canes. They are best bought late spring, about now, so its rest and growing phase coincides with um, with the, the normal with the year. Now. Yes, so I can see three questions that um, uh, need to be answered from from that paragraph. So the first question is, what were these stumps? These stumps are, in fact, cut off canes. The plant didn't need or want, let's say, these canes cut off, but the grower did cut them off, so the plant looks prettier for somebody to buy it. Which leads to the second question. Do you need to cut off these canes at the end of the flowering? No, because they are used as reservoirs for nutrients and water and they feed the new canes. When the plant does need these old canes, they will become wrinkly and yellow, and then you can cut them off. It's not like Phalaenopsis which is unique in that it can reflower on the same stem. This orchid, it, it flowers on the same stem. Normally, it would just then stop and move, let's say, to the new canes. But I say you do not cut the old cane. I think this is where I've fallen down with this plant in the past because I, in my obvious ignorance of this plant, have have cut off those stems before they've certainly before they've gone completely yellow and wrinkly and as a result I've I've thought I was doing the right thing but obviously I wasn't and you end up with a kind of an unbalanced ugly looking plant as well <laughs> the grower can do this because in the nursery chances are he's doing it just before he sells plant but he's doing it because in a, in a greenhouse you have perfect conditions whereas at home the plant is not in ideal conditions most of the time so taking away its buffer its reservoir let's say of nutrients and water is it makes it much more difficult for it to thrive so it's best left off uh, left on the le- left with the plant until the plant tells you it does need them and i guess this is why if you've grown a few phalaenopsis orchids you have to understand that the dendrobiums are a bit different because their flowering style is quite different they don't flower from the same in the same way do they they're sort of flowering from the side of the stem with a very short flowering stem as opposed to that long one that you get with phalaenopsis 
Yes, the, the phalaenopsis is, is, is different in two or three ways from other orchids. And as soon as you, you realize that most of the other orchids have two or three significant, but as a few, only few differences, then they're very easy to grow once you know one or two key things. Like the key for this one is that it has a rest and a growing period. During its rest, you keep it cool in cool, bright, dry conditions. During its growing phase, you treat it like a normal orchid. That's the key to it. And once you do this, It'll, it'll thrive. It's, it's not a difficult orchid to grow at home. Now, the third question, should I be dividing the branchlets at the bottom? And that is a difficult one to answer. It's basically the, the answer is yes and no. This orchid, if it's not given a proper rest period, can develop, not branchlets, they're called kaikis, new plantlets on the canes. If it does so, these are best sprayed with some water or mist, misted, and when they have enough roots, four or five, a couple of inches in length, they can be snapped off and then all put together in, in, a, in a small pot and you have a new plant. But on this case, in this picture, this is not a branchlet. It doesn't look to me like a branchlet. It, it just looks, looks like a new cane. The orchid looks that it could do with reporting, and now it is the right time to report it all the way until the end of June. So it is best reported, and when reported, it is good to take a little bit of, of bark from the bottom of the pot and put the orchid into its new pot, which should be only slightly bigger, a little bit deeper, so these roots go into, into the bark. So if you really, really want it, you could take that bit off, but it's risky. And you have to ask why. The best thing is to be left with the plant so you end up with a bigger, stronger, thriving plant. And what is the best mix to use with the dendrobium? Is it just like the phalaenopsis, a kind of classic orchid bark? Bark, just simply bark. Uh, you don't want bark-based or anything called compost, you know. Uh, the reason, and also it's very important, you do not, because they have long canes, a lot of people feel they need to put them in a bigger pot. But the problem with this is that it's not then easy to keep it on the very dry during it, its rest period. So if need be for weight, you could put a couple of pebbles in the pot. But the best way is just every time you report it, just a slightly at best the next size up in, 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 in terms of pot. So the next size pot only. Uh, I know I say it, it, it looks a little bit too big for its pot, but that's what it needs to to uh, to do. And I say just bark, which will enable uh, enable the grower to keep it on the on the very dry side during its rest period. Watering these orchids, I mean, is there any special requirements here? During its growing phase, uh, you what you keep it moist but not overly wet. You can use hard water if it's easy, but it's good at least from time to time to use uh, rain water, always water at lukewarm temperatures. And when the new canes, towards the end of the season, growing season, when the new canes have reached the, um, the height of the, uh, of the old canes, then you keep it on the very dry side. Very little water from time to time or heavy misting so it doesn't get bone dry until you see a new buds appearing on the new canes. The new canes are also good to be stocked, to be supported. Otherwise, they can just fall over or or they can grow not straight. Okay, that makes sense. Well, that's helped me also because I've I've got a couple of little cakeys on my dendrobium, which I have I have to say already removed <laughs> without really checking what I was supposed to do. But I've removed them and they're in a glass of water in the minute. So I must pop those up. They're quite small, but they have got decent roots on them. So they can just go into one new pot with some orchid bark and hopefully they'll go on from there. Yes, the difference with the, with the Phalaenopsis kike is, is you can just snap them off the cane of the dendrobium rather than uh, having to cut off a little bit of the stem as you would have to do with the, with the phalaenopsis. And then, yes, two or three together, put them on, uh, on a very small pot, like a nine centimeter in bark and, and uh, not too much watering, uh, at least at the start, to start off with, and then you have a new plant. And what about 
this worry that lots of people have that they have to put their orchids in see-through pots. Is that true? Or Because they can seem to come from the nursery in a see-through pot. Do we need to look for a see-through pot or are opaque ones okay? Very good question. A clear pot is good because you see the root system. Uh, the roots photosynthesize, um, especially in the case of, of Phalaenopsis. A clear pot, all else equal, is a good thing. I use clear pots for not only for orchids, for, for other plants as well, because I can see the roots. But it is not necessary to grow orchids. What is essential in a pot regarding orchids is that it has good drainage has plenty of holes for, for to drain because orchids, especially phalaenopsis, need to drain and, and dry well between waterings. The other thing also, which is uh, the secret, the secret is, is a key, is an air dome. If they have a dome, if a clear pot especially has a dome, it is definitely made for orchids because no other plant needs that kind of special pot. So there are clear pots in the market which frankly are not really good for orchids because they don't have good drainage. As long as the pot has very good drainage, a lot of big holes at the bottom is good for orchids. But all else equal, clear is better because you can also see the root system and the roots can photosynthesize. Right, so what you're saying when you say talk about the dome is the bottom of the pot isn't flat. It's got a raised section, which presumably yes. increases the surface area for more... Uh, air coming in. Uh, the many holes at the bottom of the pot give it very good drainage. The dome is mostly for aeration. The center of the root, if you think about it, is basically an inch, maybe an inch and a half from the air. Whereas in a normal pot, it's two, possibly two and a half inches away from air. That's so interesting. Well, I've learned loads about dendrobiums, Manos. That's really, really handy. And I'm sure that Giskin will be grateful for that advice. They've always been a bit of a mystery to me, I have to say, orchids, but I'm I'm slowly learning. But yeah, I'm afraid I've rather disfigured my original plant by cutting off the stem so soon. So I think I'm going to have to rely on my newly uh, removed keikis to provide the next generation that will look a bit nicer. Excellent. The weather is gorgeous and I'm off down to the shed to do some watering and some potting. You gonna come with me, Wolf? Come on then. Come on. Good dog. Off we go. Ooh. Sparrow. Just pick some broccoli to chew on.
Let's see. bag.
time to stop recording and go and have some lunch. I'll see you next week on The Ledge Fans. Bye. Hello, Wolfie. Music you heard in this episode was Roll Jordan Roll by the Joy Drops, an instrument the boy called Happy Day Gakana by Samuel Corwin, Chiefs by Jazar, and I Snost I Lost by Dr. Turtle. All tracks are licensed under Creative Commons. Visit janeperone.com for details.